and I was uh, uh, sharing this in Bible study. Is that my question? I said I would never preach unless God did something for me. And one of the things I asked to be done for me is that I wanted to learn how do I love my enemies? How do I love somebody that wants to harm me? Somebody that's already done to me. How do I love them? It's easy for me to love Brother Ricky. It's easy for me to love Chuck. That's easy. But how do I love that brother who did something to me? Or that sister who did something to me? How do I love them? And they still want to harm me. How can I love them? Show me that and I can preach the gospel. And he said it's simple. Look at them through my eyes. Separate the sin from the sin. God hates sin, not the sin. So who am I to personally have a problem with my brother or my sister when they are not the enemy? That's misdirected anger. And that becomes a sin. Directed at where it should be directed. If we learn to do that, then we're learning to look at people through his eyes and you can love anybody. You can love anybody that God created. Because he created all of us. And we're created in his image. That means the power of love is in all of us. That's what we are exploiting. If you want to use the word exploitation. Exploit love out of your brother and sister. That's what it means to seek his face. To see things through his eyes. Not through your own. No matter what you've done or what you've experienced. Learn to look at things through his eyes. What is the next thing it says to do? Turn from your wicked ways. We know what the word repent means. It means to turn from. That means when I'm faced with a dilemma, I don't do it my way. Where in the Bible does it say, not my will, but thy will be done? Throughout. What is the will of God? You can take any situation you're facing, and if you answer that question, the Bible will tell you what to do. We're faced with a situation right in this church with a new person coming here to preach, to pastor the church. What will we do? Well, what does the Bible say? What does God say? <clears throat> does it say we're supposed to love them? Does it, say, it, it doesn't say that? Yes. Does it say we're supposed to honor God in Him? Does it say we do things decently and orderly? Amen. Now where is running away in that scripture? Where is turning our back in that scripture? Where is it say to have jealousy and envy and anger before we even meet Him in that scripture? <laughs> where is that? It says to love. It says to honor. It says to cherish. <laughs> What are we loving, honoring, and cherishing? The Word of God. We honor God in a person. We cherish the power of the Holy Spirit in a person. This is what an anointing is. That's what an anointing is. And this is what we're asking God for. See, when Jesus Christ told the disciples to go to the city of Terror and wait there, until you receive power from on high. Now they had the instructions. They had the great commission. Why did he say wait? Because they needed to receive power from on high. So we need to stop doing something in our own strength. Do it in his strength. He will not grow weary. He will not faint. He will not get tired. We need to do it in his strength. Far too often we're doing things in our own strength. And we're wondering why our energy is gone. We don't have no enthusiasm anymore. We don't even welcome our visitors with enthusiasm anymore. Because we're tired. We want somebody else to help us. What is God saying to us? What happened to here I am, send me? Where is our spiritual strength that lies in the anointing that we should all be asking God for? And the Bible clearly says, if you ask for it, you will have it. If we seek it, we'll find it before this is over. 
And when I say before this is over, I'm not talking about before the world is over. I'm talking about before you are over. Or I. Because tomorrow is not promised to any of us. What is the day of salvation? Today. It's today. If you are here, it's today. If you want to be one of the ones in that number, when the saints come marching in, that's one of the first songs I learned. I didn't know what it was about. It just sounded good. And when I learned what it was truly about, my heart was struck. I'm like, oh, oh, oh. Am I in that number? Has my name been erased out of the book of life? Because if it's based on what I've done, trust me, I wouldn't be there. But if it's based on what he's done, we should all be there. Because not I, but he who is in me. I want to pledge to the church today that I believe we should go over the 2300 day prophecy in lieu of the sanctuary. We should do that. Because a lot of us don't understand what we're talking about. A lot of us, too many of us, are not engaged in the ministry. And when I say the ministry, I'm not talking about when you personally want to do something good. I'm talking about in obedience to the Great Commission. We are walking in disobedience when we are not on one accord and in one mind. And we are stifling the very spirit that we are saying we're representing. We need to pray. We need to come together. We need to be about our Father's business in spirit and in truth. You can't do one without the other. And when the scripture says, turn from your wicked ways, when we do that, then the Bible says, I will hear from heaven. <coughs> How many of us have prayed and wondered, where is the results? Jesus Christ prayed how much? Constantly. Constantly. The Bible says pray without what? Without ceasing. That means everything we do, we should be doing in the spirit of prayer. When you go to work, go to work in the spirit of prayer. When you drive your car, drive your car in the spirit of prayer. So we don't have to wonder what to do when somebody cuts us off. Because you're in the spirit of prayer. It'll come to you what to do, what to say, how to respond. Temptation is not a sin. Your response is what determines whether it's a sin or not. So what is our response? Is it glorifying God? Or is it simply just my personal opinion? We need more of God and less my opinion in the church. Nobody can be saved by my opinion. So what do we give with people? Then it says, I will forgive their sins. Now, you know what's the funny thing about saying forgive sins? Because it's really easy for us to come to church, to be on our knees and pray and say, God, please forgive me for my sins. That's easy. But you understand when you sin, it's a two-edged sword. You cannot ask for forgiveness if you're not willing to forgive. And if you're asking God to forgive me for everything you've done, then you've got to forgive people for everything they've done to you. If there's one sin you have not forgiven, when you're at the altar and asking God to forgive your sin, that's how you judge. And I know no one wants to be judged by even one sin, because if you're judged by one sin, what is the wages of sin? Death. we got to be willing to forgive all of it. Because you want God to forgive all of yours. Because just one sin, Adam and Eve had one sin, and it was over for all of us. Some of us, if we got to, to start adding up sins, oh my goodness. So we got to be able to forgive our brothers and our sisters. And if we do that, then the Bible says, what will God do? He will forgive their sins. 
Then he says he will heal their land. Does our land need to be healed? Doesn't take much to figure that one out. Every single day we want to pray for the land to be healed. Just so we can finish the work. We can't finish the work in hurricanes, in storms, in earthquakes. Hard to finish the work then. Go back to horse and buggies. No cell phones. No technology. How would you be about our father's business if you had to walk everywhere? Hard to think about that. Can we praise God without technology? Can we? Sure we could. But how many of us are prepared to do that? How many of us are prepared to praise God and be about his business when you don't have anywhere to live? When you don't have any money in the bank? <coughs> when your lights are cut off? Could we have church in here without power? Think about that. We have to be prepared to give it all to receive it all. I'll end with this. I said earlier that a sermon should be confirmation for what God has already built in your heart. And then the person that is delivering the sermon should be anointed to preach the gospel. This is what the Bible says clearly. There's no way around that. I say we should welcome a person that's coming to preach the gospel in this church. We're not planning on packing our bags because we see a different face up here. We're not doing that. That ain't what God said to us. But one thing we definitely should do is to pray, to pray, and to pray. Because everything we do, we do it to the glory of God. And God is saying to this church today that for Him to hear us, we got to be spiritually clean. We got to be praying and we got to be fasting and we got to be prepared to be obedient to His Word and to His will for the life of this church. We cannot stray to the left and we cannot stray to the right. We must remember what our true purpose is. This is why we need to teach the three angels' message. We need to remember the fundamental principles of our faith. We need to teach it in lieu of the sanctuary. If you've forgotten the sanctuary, don't worry, we're going to go over it next week. We need to know the doctrines of our faith. And we need to be about our Father's business and prayer and love one to the other. Accepting that the only difference you have in, in, for me is your faith. But we can fix that. There is no other difference. Just because of the way you live, the way you look, the way you, the way you work, that's not a difference. That's ordained by God for us to look different, for us to be different, have different personalities. That's ordained. But it's also ordained for us to love each other. Can we do that? I want to extend myself to anyone in the church who wants to engage in corporate prayer. Anyone who is in need of prayer and won't do it alone because you shouldn't be praying alone. Anyone that has a special need in terms of Bible study. Because in order for us to go through this transition, we have to be on one accord. And being on one accord starts with prayer. It starts with prayer. Does that make sense? Our benediction today is going to be prayer. We're going to sing the song, but then when we pray, I would like for us to all stand and hold hands when we pray. And I'm going to ask God's anointing on the entire church. Amen. Amen. Our closing song is 633.
Together we worship. Together we praise. Together we are in victory. Together we overcome. And together we go home. Father, I just thank you for this day, this Sabbath day. I thank you for the gathering together of this saints yet one more time. I ask you for the power of the Holy Spirit to ascend on each and every person here. Let it be clear to them what your will is for their lives. Let us be true to your word on one accord and of one mind. That we shall go forward and be about our Father's business regardless of what our circumstances are. Regardless of what society is throwing at us. Regardless of what is happening here in even our own church. That we can see your glory and we can be about your business in spirit and in truth. In the name of Jesus, we ask these blessings and give thanks. Amen.